my beautiful friends, my name is Kim and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you're interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you consider hitting that subscribe button. But I have to admit that I am not in 100% form. It's just a hot mess right now, so please just bear with me in my appearance. I pack my makeup away and it it's every ounce of energy for me to unpack and put it on, so... This is what we get today. Just excuse it. Just enjoy the story. Today's story is a mystery about the discovery of a toddler's body on the shores of Boston Harbor. It features two Michaels, one villain and one savior. This is the story of a little girl whose mother unironically named her child Nevia, or heaven spelled backwards, all while sacrificing her in a living hell. Today we're going to be talking about Bella Nevia Armosa Bond. But first, a word from our sponsor, Fabulous. Thanks to Fabulous for sponsoring today's video. Would you like to build better habits and achieve your goals? Well, let me tell you about an amazing app, Fabulous. The Fabulous app is a digital coach, a happiness trainer that uses insights from behavioral science to develop great habits that will help you live your best life. Building new habits can be hard on your own. I guess that is why Fabulous has over 30 million users, but a digital coach helps to develop and stick to healthy habits to become the best you you want to become, I can say I want to have more of a work-life balance, but how do you do that? You know, that is where Fabulous comes in and guides you based on science-backed daily routines because it's not as easy as cutting my hours. It's getting organized and other things that come with it. It only takes small steps each day that will lead to big and long-lasting changes. Fabulous can help with mental health, finding self-esteem, diet, sleeping quality, stress, the list is endless. Whatever habit you like to create for yourself and you can 100% personalize it. Choose between two approaches, habit tracking and dedicated programs. Fabulous has over 100 recommended habits or you can just create your own. The app is so user-friendly. If I can figure it out, anyone can. And I honestly mean that. The second approach, the dedicated programs, based on behavioral science, allows you to experience your best well-being goals. These journeys immerse you in your own personal adventure to help you commit to a new positive action by adding them to your daily routine, allowing these small steps to lead to long term lasting changes. I receive inspirational reminders and motivating lessons to keep me going, and I know it will for you as well. Besides habit building and tracking, Fabulous also offers support circles, online coaching sessions, and Make Me Fabulous where you can explore different exercises that will make your experience even better. Start building your ideal daily routine. The first 100 people who click on my link will get 25% off a fabulous subscription. Thanks to Fabulous for sponsoring today's video. This story begins on the shores of Deer Island in Boston Harbor. Deer Island houses a water treatment facility, but also offers recreational trails, including a 2.6 mile shoreline trail. Deer Island was once a true island, but is now connected to the mainland after a 1938 hurricane reshaped the beaches. This story occurred at the height of the opioid epidemic when Massachusetts foster homes were overcrowded with children whose parents were too dependent on narcotics to provide them with the care they deserve. Children are the youngest and most vulnerable victims of the drug culture. Fathers and mothers who outlive their daughters and sons parents whose children lie about their lifestyles and steal from their houses. The damage caused by drug abuse ripples far beyond the individual user. 
The impact on the younger generation growing up in this environment is particularly devastating. Children who watch their parents spiral into a living hell or who are abandoned or who are born addicted. In 2014, Massachusetts had the highest rate of abuse and neglected children in the entire U.S. On June 25th, 2015, a lady walking her dog on Deer Island discovered a child's body inside a plastic bag. She had been casually walking along the shore admiring the remarkable views of the city. Low tide often exposed both trash and treasures, so the assorted items left behind by the receding waters were no surprise to her at all. Suddenly, her dog started pulling her towards a certain plastic bag. The bag was quite large and did not look like the standard size plastic tr uh, you know, trash bag. The woman could not pull the bag away from the dog, so she began to wonder to herself, you know, what was the dog so interested in and why wouldn't he give up and wouldn't leave? you know, this plastic bag. Eventually, curiosity and anxiety prevailed and this woman began to gently cut open the, open the bag and froze. She saw tiny fingers and then small feet. Panicked, clearly, she cried out for help. Two legs come out folding. They just came out like that. I looked away thinking that it wasn't real. The Massachusetts State Police soon responded and confirmed that the bag held the remains of a small child. The investigator in charge was particularly shocked by the discovery as he had young children himself. The entire area was thoroughly checked. Divers explored the seabed and the police dock searched for any trace of evidence. The child's body was sent to the Massachusetts office uh, medical examiner for autopsy. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, it was not possible to identify uh, this child using facial features, but it was determined that the child was a girl. The doctor examining the girl's body stated that he could exclude the child had died from natural causes because unfortunately he was not able to determine her cause of death. He believed that baby Doe was four to five years old at the time of her death. After further investigation, it was determined that the girl was either Caucasian or Hispanic descent. She had brown curly hair and brown eyes. At the time of her finding, she was wearing a pair of white leggings with black polka dot pattern. She was wrapped in two blankets, a zebra print and a pink quilt within a knotted trash bag. Specialists from the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children were asked to create a portrait that would depict the, what the girl might look like. Unfortunately, the collected data did not match any child from the reports of missing child, you know, children that they had on file. Within four hours, a forensic artist used Adobe Photoshop to create a composite. Using mortuary and stock photographs, trying to reflect what the girl might have looked like in her life. Information about the discovery along with the image quickly circulated in the press. The media appealed to the audience for help in identifying this unnamed girl. Billboards began to appear in the Boston area saying, do you know me? Please tell the police my name. The billboards also provided a telephone number for anon anonymous tips. Unfortunately, many members of the public did not understand what the image was trying, the message that it was coming across, believing instead that it was an actual photograph of a missing child. Either way, it really didn't look like her. In my opinion, I'll, I'll put them on the screen, you tell me. Pleading for the public's help, Suffolk County District Attorney Dan Conley asked if there was an accident or worse, if there was mischief there that resulted in a criminal act, clear your conscience, step forward and make yourself known because nobody deserves that kind of ending. Authorities used all possible investigative techniques to find the girl's murderer and to discover her identity. 
For example, the phone numbers logged in the near Boston Harbor Lighthouse were checked, and the families who purchased the same white polka dot pants, leggings, um, as found on the girl were also tracked down. Investigators discussed whether the body could have drifted from far away or whether she was born in a family of undocumented immigrants who feared deportation if they contacted the police. Even John Walsh, known for his TV show America's Most Wanted, publicized the case on his show, The Hunt with Joe Walsh. Walsh emphasized that somebody certainly knew the girl's identity and based on his many years of experience, he believed that the girl's murderer could be someone from her closest circle and such as her parents. He stated on TV that if anyone knew who this girl was, they could contact him and that he would ensure that their anonymity would be secure. Finally, there was a long-awaited breakthrough in the case. The sister of a man named Michael Sprinsky reported to the investigators that Rochelle Bond had contacted him. Rochelle told him that her boyfriend, Michael McCarthy, had murdered her two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Bella. Who is Bella? At first, to provide background on her home life, I'm going to tell you about her biological parents. We do not have much information about Bella's grandparents. Rochelle alleged that she grew up in a house full of abuse and superstition and experienced beatings and violence. Unfortunately, the only effect of the violence was that Rochelle sought relief in substances such as heroin. To get money for her hard drugs, she stole, committed petty crimes, became a sex worker, and also worked at a strip club. Before Bella was born, Rachel had two sons, but she had lost custody of both of her sons. They were taken away by Child Protective Services. Rachel met Bella's father, Joe Armarzo, when they were both homeless. They participated in the Occupy Boston protest together and used drugs together as well. While three months pregnant, Rochelle was brought before a judge facing jail time for violating every term of her probation. Her attorney successfully argued before the court that it would be better for the pregnant Rochelle to attend a drug rehab program rather than jail. The attorney is quoted as saying, Miss Bond is carrying a child who is voiceless in this particular manner. Poor Bella would in fact be voiceless for all of her short life, trapped with a mother with poor choices, including her addiction to substances and her decision to live with violence and an equally addicted man. Rochelle's baby Bella was born on August 6, 2012, and she named her Bella Nevia Bond. Nevia is heaven spelled backwards. Mother and child lived for several months in a homeless shelter before moving to an apartment where the state assisted in rental costs. Bella's biological father, Joe, left town soon after Bella was conceived. The father had a lengthy criminal history in both Boston and Florida. He never met Bella in person, but would occasionally talk to Bella on the phone and post photos on uh, his Facebook Rochelle tried to prove that she was ready to be a mother by being sober for her daughter. They lived together in a clean home and her daughter received regular medical care as well as nutritious food. Remember when Bella's body was found, she was estimated to be around four or five years old. This indicates that she was well nourished and healthy because she was actually just over two years old. While the family was supervised by the state's Department of Child and Family Services for the first year of Bella's life, supervision over Rochelle and Bella ended in 2013. She was doing well. There was no need for she was sober. She had uh, adequate housing. 
So uh, it ended in 2013. Despite Bella's mother's criminal past and her addiction, DCF found that Bella's living conditions were satisfactory and Bella was in good health. Witnesses and Rochelle's friends confirmed that at the time, little Bella was always healthy, was never hungry, had clean clothes, and her room was beautifully decorated. However, Bella had no choice in her mother's decisions. Rochelle, who remembered what it was like to be homeless, sometimes offered shelter to her friends. Some of these friends were, of course, homeless or drug addicts. But one friend turned out to be a blessing in Bella's life. Her name was Shannon Taylor. Herself homeless was invited to move in with Rochelle and Bella in the spring of 2014. Shannon was an alcoholic who kept a liquor bottle at her side constantly in order to starve off any effects of withdrawal, but she soon discovered Bella loved to climb in her lap and then would try to reach for her bottle. Bella inspired Shannon to stop drinking. From Shannon, we have a witness to life within Bella's home. Shannon recalls that Rochelle smoked marijuana at the time, but never took substances. The home was clean and filled with toys. Rochelle had a quick temper, so Shannon would wake up early and get Bella from bed, and they would both have breakfast together, watch cartoons, they would either color or read together. Later in the day, all three of them would go to the park or to a grocery store, but usually all played together inside. Shannon provided love and stability for both Bella and Rochelle. But in late October of 2015, Rochelle had a falling out with Shannon and banished her from the home in Bella's life. Less than three months later, Rochelle met Michael McCarthy, and within six months, tragedy would strike. Bella and Rochelle's fortunes were cut short by the arrival of Michael McCarthy in their lives. Rochelle had been prescribed Suboxone, a medication that reduced her cravings and withdrawal symptoms. Instead of taking the medication she received from the clinic, Rochelle would sell her pills. One of her customers was McCarthy. When she sold him her pills in January of 2015, she also provided her phone number, and shortly thereafter, he moved in with Rochelle and Bella. Michael McCarthy was a strange, substance-addicted man who shunned good hygiene and had a fascination with the occult. After the death of his mother, he turned to substances to ease his pain. At the same time, McCarthy was nurturing his interest in demonology and Satanism. Michael Sprinsky, okay, so Sprinsky, I'm talking about two Michaels. And as I mentioned, there's a good one and a bad one. Sprinsky is the good one. McCarthy is the bad one. Sprinsky, who would end up tipping the police on Bella's identity, detailed in court, McCarthy's interest in serial killers, demons, and the occult. Sprinsky would report that McCarthy believed he could remove demons and evil spirits from a person or place. Once McCarthy moved in, Rochelle's use of drugs resumed. Neighbors noticed that Rochelle lost way too much weight and often appeared to be under the influence of drugs. Bella, who was always outgoing and happy, now cried often and loudly enough for the neighbors to hear. They didn't know that McCarthy would frequently lock her in the closet at those times. Sprinsky once sought shelter with the family, with Bella and Rochelle, but he moved out within two weeks, citing his discomfort with McCarthy's obsession with the occult. But while he was still living there, he witnessed Bella being locked in the closet twice for 30 to 60 minutes at a time, as well as McCarthy frequently belittling Bella, yelling at her and spanking her. Rochelle and McCarthy were so deep in the clutches of addiction that the exact date of Bella's death has not been established to this day. It is estimated that she died between April and May of 2015. On that fateful night, Bella did not want to go to bed. 
and sought solace in her mother, who was watching TV. Impatient, Rochelle finally asked McCarthy to take Bella back to her bed. In time, Rochelle was concerned about the strange silence in the apartment. She decided to check what was going on. Her quote, I didn't think he'd hurt her, Bond said, choking back tears. I thought it would be all right, unquote. When she entered her daughter's room, she was shocked. She saw that McCarthy was punching little Bella in the abdomen with all his strength, so hard that she bounced up. She started screaming at McCarthy and rushed to help Bella, who was already gray and swollen skin. Rochelle started CPR while screaming at McCarthy. McCarthy, when asked by the desperate mother why he did it, he only replied, quote, It was her time to die. She was a demon, unquote. So no, she, it was her time to die. She was a demon. He punched her in the stomach. Where was she? Laying in the bed. I saw my green duffel bag. And I can see her thigh through it. Like, it was her in there. McCarthy grabbed the shocked and screaming mother by the neck and started to choke her until she fainted. While Rochelle woke up, she was already on the couch in the living room. She felt Michael inject a very strong dose of drugs into her neck to calm her down. McCarthy forbid her to talk to anybody about the incident, threatening to kill her. When the neighbors noticed Bella's absence, her mother said that Bella was in the custody of DCF. When the father banged on Rochelle's door demanding to see his daughter, she told him that Bella was spending time with family members that month. Months later, in September of 2015, McCarthy went to the hospital for abscesses on his arm for shooting up substances. Then Bond, apparently, was finally freed. According to Rochelle's attorney, Janice Basil, the first thing she did was tell somebody. The attorney added, referring to a text message Rochelle sent to Sprinsky, after a few days of being sober, she proudly called Sprinsky, but when he asked about Bella, she broke down in tears and told him the truth. In disbelief, he looked up news reports on Baby Doe and saw the clothing and blanket found with the body. He recognized the blankets wrapped around Bella's body, and he told his sister what he knew. She, in turn, called investigators. Afterwards, Sprinsky texts McCarthy, quote, She told me everything. Can't stop puking. She says you killed Bella, unquote. And please say it ain't so, Mike. Please, you know exactly what I'm talking about, unquote. McCarthy responded, quote, who are you going to believe, me or a cracked out hooker, unquote. Around the same time, Rochelle confessed the truth to Bella's father, Joe. The next day, Baby Doe was identified as Bella Bond on the news. Rochelle Bond turned herself over to the police without incident. She was initially charged with accessory to murder after the fact. With no other witnesses and limited forensic evidence, prosecutors offered Rochelle Bond a plea deal in exchange for the time served and followed by two years probation. She would testify against McCarthy. Rochelle Bond pled guilty to being an accessory after the fact of the murder and larceny of over $250. And why she received that is because she had continued to collect housing benefits for Bella after her death. In turn, McCarthy was very calm and calculated during his interrogation, insisting that Bella was alive and had been taken by DCF. He insisted that he did not injure Bella at all. Prosecutors charged him with first degree. McCarthy's trial began in June of 2017. 169 pieces of evidence was presented. The father sat in the first row of the courtroom. The prosecution was largely dependent on Rochelle's testimony. 
McCarthy and his attorney repeatedly questioned Bond's claims, suggesting that Rochelle was lying and was in fact responsible for Bella's death. McCarthy alleged that Bella may have died after accidentally taking her mother's prescription medication. The pills are pink and um, in Bella's stomach content, there was a pink fluid. McCarthy's lawyer said, however, according to Bond's attorney, McCarthy held Bond captive and had threatened to kill Bond if she said anything. He injected her with a gram of substance in her neck every day for months to keep her cooperative, according to the father. The attorney would call Bond a monster who made up a web of lies to put the blame on his client. Prosecutors focused on McCarthy's interest in the occult. According to Sprinsky, the friend, McCarthy had an equally robust belief in conspiracy theories. After the trial, McCarthy would tell WBZ that, quote, they were saying that I essentially believe that Bella Bond was inhabited by demons. They needed to put this on somebody, unquote. They were saying that, you know, uh, I essentially believed that Bella Bond was in, inhabited by demons. Did you think Bella was a demon? Of course not. She was a beautiful little girl. McCarthy argued the court did not prove Bella was killed during a satanic ritual, nor was it ultimately thought about the occult, what he thought about the occult. The defense's counterpoint was that Bella's mother, Rochelle, not McCarthy, who believed her daughter was possessed. Ultimately, the judge advised the jury could consider a lesser charge than first degree, including second degree or involuntary manslaughter. On June 26, 2017, the jury returned a verdict of guilty of second degree murder and McCarthy was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. He is eligible for parole in 2037. Bella was laid to rest in Belle Isle Cemetery beside her paternal great-grandmother in a private ceremony. The gravestone includes a photo of Bella and the words, Our Special Angel. There is also a sleeping angel and a kitten because she loved animals, especially cats. Bella Bond's casket was covered by a beautiful handmade quilt in her favorite color, pink. In 2018, Rochelle Bond broke the terms of her probation. Surprise, surprise. She failed a court-ordered drug test and failed to attend her probation appointments. Bond pled guilty to the violation and agreed to an added condition of probation where she'll be attending a drug rehabilitation program. Sprinsky entered a drug rehabilitation program following the initial report to the police, he remains clean and sober to this date. I, you know, I have to say that Rochelle was a victim, or I believe she is, but I don't know. While pushing Bella in her stroller, Rochelle Bond sold her prescription medications. She invited people over to her home in order to trade her medications. On the, un on the other hand, though, the neighbor recalled Rochelle playing peekaboo with Bella and sang prayers with her before meals. Rochelle Bond, and this is what's kind of off, is Rochelle Bond said she was still able to parent Bella even while she was on substances. She was always happy, they would say. The father said he chose the name Bella for her because it means beautiful and that she was beautiful. He remembered her as happy, smart, who loved Hello Kitty and knew how to make a pizza. How'd she know how to make a pizza? She was two and a half. Anyways, he said he believed she would have excelled in college if she had grown up and that she would grow up to be a beautiful, successful woman who loved life. He also added that Bella was a gift from God whose life was cut short at such a young age. But Bella was, still is, and always be in 
their heart and soul, he continued. I understand why they didn't give Rochelle a harsher sentence in efforts to testify against McCarthy, but I have to wonder about the story she gave and her involvement. She knew he locked her in a closet and would spank Bella. So in my opinion, she got off way too easy. But you guys let me know what you think. And let's leave a pink heart in the comments for Bella's favorite color. Thanks to all my channel members who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like to become a channel member or a Patreon, you can do so by clicking the link in the description box. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. Even though I look like this, you guys are amazing. But thanks for being here. And remember, if you see something, say something. And I'll see you in my next one. Bye. Bye.